But this week I was going to, it's going to take a minute to get rid of this Tic Tac, so pardon me, you know, I'm working on it. It's small though, but it's good. So instead of preaching through the book of Ephesians, which I was going to do, um, I, like all the rest of you, got invaded with something this past week. You know, everything that's going on in Orlando, right? Crazy. And, um, you know, I was baffled. Like, they said it was the, 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 the worst shooting ever in America. You know what I'm saying? Like, not a war, but like just a, a crazy shooting. The most death. <clears throat> and, and, and that's devastating, and it's, it's sweeping the nation, sweeping the globe, really. And it was, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's concerning. Like, it's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's madness. P- guy, guy goes in and just starts shooting everybody, just crazy. And, you know, tying it to ISIS, maybe. I, uh, everything. It's just, it, but, you know, it, it, it was, it's worse than, than just the shooting because, what it does, what what it does, um, is it 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 it's like a it opens the wound of all the rest of the stuff that's crazy in our world, right? It reminds you of of all the other things that are going on, and and it's and and so instead of it uh, just being an isolated incident where someone goes in and just does something heinous, which is bad enough. But then on top of that, it becomes, uh, it goes deeper. And so now it's, well, he went into a, a gay bar and shot up all these people that were practicing this lifestyle. And now it's that issue too. Like it's almost like that has escalated beyond the actual murder that, that this community was invaded. And so now their peace has been invaded and they went there for sanctuary and that's been invaded and then so then you start thinking about all of that stuff and transgender and and it's just it brings up all this stuff that's going on in our country and I don't know about you but like it 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 just I'm overwhelmed really at at the the way our country is like I'm not this is not a political I'm not like a Republican Democrat thing here tonight but I'm, I'm overwhelmed with what's going on in our world. Like, it's crazy. And this event has just brought it all up to the surface. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I, I, was, I was pretty much, um, I guess I was nerdy in the sense that I really liked golf. Like, I liked golf pre-Tiger Woods days. I liked golf Jack Nicholas and Tom Watson days. And, and it wasn't so popular Unless you were an old man with plaid pants, it was not a popular game. It, be, the, the cool kids, really, they were into baseball and basketball and football, right? And, but I like golf. And, but then all of a sudden, something happened. This guy, Tiger Woods, comes along, and he starts winning everything. And all of a sudden, it becomes very popular to, to like golf. Now, golf is just thriving, right? I mean, it's, it's one of the big ones. And so something happened, this, this trend enters into the country, and all of a sudden, what wasn't, now it is. And the exact reverse has happened with Christianity. Years ago, it was, I don't want to say it was hip, because I wasn't around, so I can't say it was hip or not, or cool, but it was common, at least, to be Christian. Like, this country, like, it was a bunch of Christian people. Like, granted, there were others, but it was mostly, it was Christian people in this country worshiping Christ. That's what we did. It was a very popular thing. Sundays, everyone went to church. Stores closed. There was no business. You, you just went to church. You went to church in the morning. You had lunch a- in the afternoon. You came back to church in the, after- in the evening. It was a day that you just gave it to God. Giving a day of the week to God was not uncommon. That was the common thing to do, but something has happened. You can't hardly beg someone to go to church anymore. And I don't understand why. <clears throat> but it happened. It happened. The, the, the tide has turned. It used to be that, that you would encourage the preacher to, to preach the word of God. And, and in season and out of season, to boldly preach the word of God. Now if you preach the word of God from cover to cover, it's hate speech. There was a day that if you even thought about aborting a baby, you were a murderer. 
Now you can't even talk about supporting pro-life because you're, you, you, you're, you're self-centered and it's all about the woman and, it's, and how dare you tell me what to do. And, and, and we're the outcasts in our society because we honor life. There's the LGBT community. Now listen, this is not the gospel. This is Moses speaking now. And I want to frame my words. I pray that the Holy Spirit will frame my words because I don't want to hurt somebody needlessly. I want it to be truth. But when you call a community that is, you know what a community is? It's a group of people that come together with one purpose. When you call a community that comes together around the purpose of a sin, when you, us, I'm not talking about the outside world, when the Christian body of Christ refers to a group of people as a community, you're condoning what they do. It is, should we start communities of greedy people? Should we start communities of killers? Should we start communities of, hey, who wants to join my porn watching club? Who would do such a thing? That's exactly what we do. Listen, when that man walked into that bar and he killed, that was wrong. It wouldn't matter if they were gay or straight or purple or green, young, old, doesn't make any difference. No human being has the right to take another human being's life. You are not God. It doesn't make any difference what the person's sin is. We, listen, you do not identify someone by the sin they commit. That's not who they are. You are Daisy, and that's it, right? You are Robert. Anyone in here ever selfish? Raise your hand if you're selfish. Why, why don't we call you that? Why don't we start doing that? Let's start the... Listen, when, when someone gets... When we watch the news tonight, someone's going to die. And it's bad news, isn't it? Someone's going to get killed. But hardly ever do you hear someone say... Well, there was a robbery in uh, Altamont today, and uh, James uh, Stewart, or whatever, uh, who, by the way, is greedy and self-centered, and I think he cheats on his wife. Someone killed him, and that's what this fiasco has turned into. It's wrong. And that's the work of the enemy of our soul. You know, it's funny. <clears throat> my, my wife's uh, cousin, her name is Wendy Nanny. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a Republican to be a Christian, because that's, that's a crazy thought. But she is a state representative, listen, in Greenville, South Carolina. You remember, in this country, this, country was, this, was the, this was like a Christian nation, right? Everyone around here was Christian. And then all of a sudden, it turned into the Bible Belt, where, where it, didn't, it wasn't quite as Christian everywhere anymore, but there was a, still this, this safe haven. You could come down to the south, and you could worship God, and everyone around you was a Christian. They might be Methodist, and they may be Baptist, but they may be this, but they were Christians, and you were in this little safe haven. Well, Greenville, South Carolina, is the most conservative, Republican, like, there's, a, there's two churches on every corner in Greenville, and she is a Bible-believing, she just passed a, an anti abortion law in that, in that district. that They got rid of the late-term abortions. Praise God, right? She had that thing up. It was awesome. And she just got defeated by an openly homosexual man. And the reason that she was told that she lost is because the people in Greenville, in the ultimate Bible belt of this country, said, we're tired of all this church stuff. That's rough. Yeah. Tired of all the church stuff. In the Bible Belt. It doesn't get... What's next, Dallas? I don't know what's going down next, but, man, we got to fight. Yeah. It's time to stand up and stop being cowardly. We need to stand up. And this event right here, it brings up all these thoughts, doesn't it? What's happening and so when, I, when this started, when this went down, it was after our service on Saturday, and I couldn't respond to it because that hadn't happened, really. And so <clears throat> anyway, I, when it started happening, I, I started looking for answers, too. Like, why would this happen? 
what do we do? How do we respond to that one, right? And I didn't know what to do. But um, what I would recommend to you and is what I did, and that's you, you go to the scriptures for answers. You know, don't just call your bestie. Go to the scriptures. Oh, these stupid things. This is the fixed microphone. Go to the scriptures for your answers, and that's what I did. And the Holy Spirit of God is faithful. Not only did he uh, write this book, but he also directs his kids to the place they need to go to find the answer to the question they have. And he did. And I want to share that with you. So if you would, please open up a Bible. Don't, don't not do that. Open up a Bible. Uh, first to Psalm 11. Psalm 11 was written by uh, David, King David. A great man of God, a sinner just like the rest of us, desired the things of God, but uh, weak at times, uh, flawed for sure, uh, but genuinely wanted the things of God. Sounds like pretty much everyone in this room, correct? Okay, so, so this is, these are the words of David as inspired by God himself back to God, and, and this is what he says in, in Psalm uh, 11. I want to read right at the beginning, actually, not to, uh, as the screen might say. Can I see that? I can't see that screen, Dan. Can I see that? I just want to make sure that I... Yeah, I screwed up. Perfect. Okay, so 11.1. So I want to start reading there. And this is what David says. He says, I trust in the Lord for protection. Now, now I don't know... Stop there for a second. I don't know who he's talking to, who he's referring to here, it, who he's actually like having this conversation with, because it doesn't say... But he, he's talking to someone, and he says, So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? <clears throat> I'll get back to that. The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on bow strings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. So here, here's, here's David, and he's, he's like, like, I trust in God, right? And, I, and you don't have to raise your hand, but if I asked you guys right now if you trust in God, I'm sure most of you would raise your hand. I know everyone in this room, and I know that you proclaim Christianity, and I see the fruit in your life, and I know that you do trust God. But sometimes people would give you other suggestions on what to do when times are tough like this, right? Uh, so let me, do, let me just go on, and, and let me read what it says. It says, they shoot from the shadows... All at those whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? That sounds like right here, right now, doesn't it? It's massive chaos in our world. And, and, and so we, we as Christians, not that we're righteous in any way because our righteousness is filthy rags. No matter what good you do, it's really not good enough. The righteousness you have is because Christ went to the cross. You gave him death. He gave you life. You gave him ugly. He gave you beautiful. You gave him dark. He gave you light, right? So you're righteous because when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. So the Christian, we're the righteous. We're the ones who are just like David, failures in many ways, but our desire is to do what God would want. And so he says, uh, he, and so he's the righteous one. And we're the righteous ones. And we look around us and, it's a, and the foundations of law and order have collapsed. God, what do we do? I don't know what to do with this situation. So let's go back and see what it actually says here. I think what this psalm is going to tell us is how we actually should act. We go back to that part where it says, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety. I don't know about you, and again, I'm going to step away from the Bible and just get, and get on my soapbox a little bit, but when I read, so why do you tell me to fly away like a bird to the mountains for safety? Some people think that when things are unwinding like this, it's the end times. It's all unwinding. We've got to gather up our guns and gather up our fishing poles and get enough hurricane supplies and get off the grid and get some solar panels going and we're going to have to live off the land because it's unwinding. I don't know about you, but that's what I see when I read that verse. Why do you tell me to run away to the mountains? Like, why, why, are, you, why are you telling me that I should go seek provision and safety from something other than God? I trust in God, he said. Why are you telling me to do something different? You know, the scriptures tell us to, to, to seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness and all the things you need will be given to you. There's no star right there that says, except for the end times. Then I'm, gonna, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what's going on. So you're going to have to take care of yourself then. 
No, he doesn't say that. He said, he's a loving father who will take care of your every need. And it doesn't matter when it is. He's going to take care of us. What can the righteous do? I'm going to give you four things. Four practices. And we can practice daily in response to the chaos that's around us. And you're going to find them right here in God's word. That first one was a freebie. That's not part of the four. Here's the first one. We want to practice proper perspective. Now look here. Look at the words here. It says, The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on bow strings. They shoot from the shadows. When I read that, to me, that's like, the shadows? That's the coward. You know the man who just did that the other day? He's a coward. He didn't tell anyone, here I come! Guns are slinging. You better get ready for me. No. He's a coward. He's a coward. He walked in under the radar, made friends, had a drink, pulled his gun out and started blowing people away. Terrorists are cowards. They don't, they don't declare war and say, come on, me and you, let's go right now. That's a man. That guy right there, he's a coward. And that's what it says right here. They shoot from the shadows. They're hiding. It also reminds me of, of, of the tree of Christianity that's, that's not being uh, lopped away at with a, with, a, with a chainsaw, but it's these people that are going at it with a little, like a little spoon and picking away at a little. See, they don't come out and say, we're going to end Christianity in this country. They don't do that, do they? You know what they do? They pick on the things that we hold precious. They take God out of the school. You can't pray. Can't have God and tr we trust on our money. Can't have one nation under God in our pledge. They deal with the little issues. They're discreet. They're quiet. They're secretive. They're cowards. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. So what do we do? We have to practice proper perspective. <clears throat> when circumstances are good, we praise God, don't we? When our job is going well and maybe we got a promotion, what do we say? Praise God. When our family's doing well and all the kids are doing well in school and the kids are getting along, what do we say? You can do better than that. What do we say? When the cash is flowing, what do we say? You know where all your wretched hearts are. Ah! <laughs> I wouldn't mind a little either. I'm just saying. When your team is winning, praise God. When the economy is rocking, praise God. When our health is good, praise God. Can I hear you? How about when the weather's nice? You walk out, there's a beautiful day. What do you say? Now, I've loaded your lips. You still don't know what you're supposed to say? That's the Mary section back there. It's purple. It's a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll. You remember that? Donnie and Marie? Purple. I just aged myself. <laughs> Listen, when everything's going well in your world, praise God, right? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, but. but when circumstances take a turn, are we still praising God? Yes. Not everybody. Everyone's like, yeah, I do all the time. I'll do all the time. They're talking about all the other guys. They're not talking to me. But you've got to remember something. We're talking about proper perspective, right? Look at back at the text. The, 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 the foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? And then he goes, he says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. So the point is this, that even when things are bad, God is still on his throne. He, he's not like caught off guard. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. But he hasn't left. He's not out to lunch. He's not sleeping. The Bible says he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. 
He, he hasn't checked out. And he's like, well, I, I can't deal with this right now. If they were all Republican, we'd be good. But if we're not, I don't know what to do. <clears throat> Here's the second thing you need to know. We're, we're practicing proper perspective. Read on. He's very aware. Not only is he there in his throne still ruling, but he's also very aware. Look what he says here at the end of verse 4. He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. It wobbles. Praise God. <sighs> no matter how nice this church ever gets, this is a reminder it's never going to be that good. I had to prop it up with cardboard. <clears throat> Isn't that awesome? Praise God for the cardboard. <clears throat> so he's very aware. But you know what? The Holy Spirit inspired this book, right? And, and, and he chose the words carefully. And he shouldn't just blaze by it real quick. Look what he says. He doesn't just say that he's up in heaven kind of looking at stuff. He says that he examines, right? He, he watches everyone closely. He's examining every person on earth. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. So he's not just looking, right? He's, when you go to a doctor, he, he gives you an examination. He just doesn't come up to you, put, your, put his hand on your head and go, uh, 98.6. Yeah, that's it. Uh, give him some medicine. They don't do that, right? There's an examination. They, 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 they look at you closely. They evaluate everything that's going on. So God is not just looking and seeing what's going on, but he's, he's, he understands why it's going on. So he sees the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the bad, the wicked and the holy. He's looking at all of us. He knows exactly what's going on, and he's examining it because he, he, he knows why. He knows what's going on on the inside. You need to know that. Here's the third thing as we pra practice proper perspective that he's a just God. So he's on his throne and he's examining everything that's going on, everyone that's doing it. He hates those who love violence. He, see, he, say, he will. Say he will. he will. That's a definitive statement, is it not? He will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked. That's a reference, I believe, to Sodom and Gomorrah as he passes judgment on those who are wicked punishing them with scorching winds. For the righteous Lord loves justice. And, and I love this. He says that, that, that he will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked. However, the virtuous, they'll see his face. I think, uh, I don't know about, about you, what you think, but my, my opinion here is that he's referencing heaven and hell. That those who cons consistently practice wickedness and violence are going to experience an eternity of, of blazing coals and burning sulfur and scorching winds. But, but the righteous, they will see his face. And the Revelation says that there won't even be a need for a light because the Lord will be with his people and he will be the light. You will see his face. You will see his face. We have to practice the right perspective. Sometimes you just got to preach to yourself a little bit, don't you? You got to tell yourself these things. Don't just hear it tonight and let it go flying out the other ear. Practice this stuff. <clears throat> and no one is good at anything without practicing, right? Here's the second thing. We practice the right perspective. We also uh, practice praising God. Uh, do me a favor and go to Psalm 42. Psalm 42 11 and Psalm 43, 5 are the exact same words. Why? God wants to make a point. We have to practice praising Him. When you look at the stuff that's going on in this world, it's a little discouraging, isn't it? You get a little lost, a little scared. What do I do? What now? What can the righteous do? How do I respond to this? It's unwinding, God. I'm down. What should I do? And, and the psalmist is feeling the same thing. And in Psalm 42, 11, he says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Now, before we read on, 
It's, those are not just rhetorical questions. Think. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Why am I down? And you start entertaining why. Think about the things that are bringing you down. What are they? You start thinking about them. You start thinking about them. And it's at that point he changes his tune and he says, enough is enough. You got to preach to yourself sometimes. Enough is enough. My hope is not in our government. My hope is not in my country. My hope is not in my job. My hope is not in my wife. My hope is not in my church. My hope is not in my kids. My hope is in nothing except one thing. My hope is in God. And see, that's the problem. We focus on all, all this stuff that's going on, and it's freaking us out as a church. And we don't know what to do. God's on his throne. God's on his throne. Nothing, your inheritance has not changed. No amount of violence, no terrorism, no government, no taxes, no terrorism could change the inheritance God has for you in heaven. Nothing will change. But we freak out. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. I'm going to read Psalm 43 out loud. Because it, it's, it's a little bit more of an elaborating uh, psalm. He's talking a little bit more about why he's discouraged and his heart is sad. And he follows it up with the same thing. But he says, declare me innocent, O God. Like he, he, the, the psalmist feels the, the weight of being in a society where it's just gone so wrong. But, but he knows he's not participating in that. And he, he wants God to declare him innocent. Defend me against these ungodly people. Rescue me from these unjust liars. For you are God, my only safe haven. Then he says something that probably a lot of us would probably say at times when things are rough. But only if you're honest would you admit it. Why have you tossed me aside, God? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? You ever feel that way? Where are you at, God? I thought you loved me. I thought you loved my country. I thought you loved your church. Why? Why? Well, that's honest. And there's nothing wrong with being open and honest with God. He sees your heart anyway, so you might as well just be honest with him. <clears throat> Send out your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them lead me to your holy mountain, to the place where you live. There I will go to the altar of God, to God, the source of all my joy. I will praise you with my harp. Oh, God, my God. And again, he says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And he's reminded again of the things that are going on. He just elaborated on it a little bit. But he's reminded again and again of the faithfulness of God. He's like, I'm going to put my hope in God. See, the hope is this confident expectation of a better tomorrow. And that doesn't rest in your government. It doesn't rest in your friends or your family, your kids, your political affiliation, how good the economy's doing, your job. Nothing. It's in God. The only reason why anything could go better tomorrow than it did today is if God's grace is upon you. That's it. And that's why this, this is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, he said at the end of his book, he's elaborating in the third chapter about how things in his nation are, are falling apart as well. Uh, he's looking all around him. He sees chaos and confusion and all this bad stuff. And no one's worshiping God. No one's doing right. And he says this in verse 17 of chapter 3. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. He is praising God when things are bad, he doesn't care. He's not, he does, eyes are not upon his situation. His eyes are upon the Lord, who is in control of every situation. He is still on his throne. King David said in Psalm 34, 1, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly seek, speak his praises. That's descriptive text. That's for you. And you know, 
that verse is, a, is an awesome verse, and it not only speaks to us personally, like, I will praise the Lord all the time. I, I, my, you know, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will, right? You know that song? It's awesome, right? And, but, but listen, it's not just a call to a personal praise. It's a call to the church, to us. So the, t- the text goes on in verse 3. It says, to come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name Together, as a family of faith, that's what we're to do. And I have to tell you that the presence and the value of God is not predicated on your circumstances. He is God. He is on his throne. He is examining everyone and everything, and his justice will prevail, no matter what. He is very aware of all things. And so since his existence and his power and his just and his love and his mercy and his grace are all there no matter the circumstances, that means he's worthy to be praised at all times. At all times. So here's the third thing. We're to practice right perspective. We're to practice praising God. But we're also supposed to practice praying. We're supposed to pray, but it's a specific prayer. I need a drink. It's not just praying. We're supposed to pray all the time. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. And I'm guilty of not accomplishing that. But my heart, like David, is to be that man. But I haven't got there yet. But God is not done with me yet. Amen? Amen. He's not done with you. Here's the thing about personal praying. Okay, listen. If I was to go up to you, Mike, if I was to go up to you right now, and just unannounced, an absolute haymaker, and just labeled you right in the face right now. What's the normal response out of an out of a everyday red, red-blooded American man? What's the response? Eye for an eye, eye, for an eye right? <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you because I know you could take me. I'm smarter than that. <clears throat> but that's exactly it. Our normal human response to a, a, an evil, aggressive act that's been put upon us uh, or towards a, an aggressive persecution of ourself or our faith or some type of aggressive hurt, uh, two things you can do. You're either going to respond in kind, right, or you're going to absorb it. You're, if someone punches you, you're going to let them have it. If someone hurts you, you're going to hurt them. Or you're going to just take it on the chin. A lot of people tell you to do that. Just take it on the chin. Absorb it. Just let it roll off your back. Like that's, they say it like it's easy. <laughs> okay? And I'm going to tell you that both of those approaches are completely wrong. They're both wrong. And I'm not making anything up. I want to show you something in Scripture. I'm going to read you a psalm. And I want you to see if you can... See the parallel here. Psalm 15.1 says this, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Psalm 15.18 says, A hot-tempered person starts fights, a cool... Look at your neighbor and say, I'm cool. I knew no one would say that. A cool-tempered person stops fights. So I said that the response of acting in kind is not the right one. Can you see the parallel there? You see it? So if someone comes at you harshly, if you respond harshly, what do you do? Tempers flare! And we know that in experience too because when, when, when we take out the, 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 the leader of, a, of an evil faction or an evil nation, uh, we, we, no, it's never happened where we take out the leader and the, and the nation goes, well, they got our guy. We're done. Pack, pack up our stuff. We're done. No more terrorism. Sorry to bother you guys. We're out of here. That's never happened. But in our arrogance, we do that. We take them out. Listen, this has been going on for thousands of years. I don't know how many more foolish attempts to try to conquer evil with evil and failure before we finally get it. You can't kill someone who's killing people because when you kill killers, you make them matter. 
Right? Am I the only one who understands this? This is what happens. When, when we take out the leader of a, of a terrorist group, they, they don't go, oh, they got us. They go, how dare you? We're going to get you more. They get madder, right? It happens all the time. It doesn't work. Bible's right again. Check for God. So here's the other one. We absorb it, right? Don't, don't fight back. Be a pacifist. Peace loving. Blessed are the peacemakers. Right? <laughs> Just take it on the chin. There's a movie out a while back. I think it was called The Sin Eater. Yeah, you ain't him. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 15 says this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. So that's, when you absorb it, where does it go? Right here, right? Goes in. No one can see it, right? It's just in there. That's where the root is. And, and when, when this stuff starts to grow and you absorb it, uh, it, the Bible, which we just all agreed is right again, it says that it brings you trouble. You, well, you can't absorb someone else's flaws and sin over and over again and expect anything except toxicity. Right? And, 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 but, but then you might say this. You might take it the next step and go, well, you know what? I'll deal with that. I'll absorb your sin, and, and I'll deal. That's my problem. Okay, so it's, it troubles me, but that's okay. That's my problem. As long as it doesn't affect other people, right? It's okay. That's my problem. I'll deal with it on my own, right? Except the verse doesn't end. It says, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, comma, corrupting many. You see, when you're troubled and you absorb all that hatred and bitterness and then your wife and kids come home and they want to play with you and you've been absorbing bitterness all day, you're bitter and it affects them. And you walk home and someone sinned against you and you take it out on your family because you haven't done what you should with it. You absorbed it, and now they want to play with you. Get away from me, kid! And she says one thing wrong, and you fly off the handle, red in the face, stuffed collar, I'm red, I'm mad, walking like i got a pack of hot dogs in my neck. Ah! It corrupts many when you absorb the bitter root. <clears throat> so what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do when there's so much going on? When there's so much evil and so much persecution and hurt. Well, not plan A in kind, no. It makes tempers flare, starts fights. Plan B, absorb it, no. The bitter root causes you trouble and corrupts the people around you. So there's got to be a better plan, right? And the Bible has a better plan. So let's try plan C, and I want to invite you to go to Luke chapter 6 with me and see God's plan in response to evil and persecution and hurt, which is common and rampant in our society. The foundations of law and order have fallen and corrupted. What do we do? What do the righteous do? Do we fight back? Do we absorb it? Now pay attention because this is Jesus talking. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. You there? I'll give, I see some pages still turning. I'll give you a moment. Jesus said, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, pause and look up here. <clears throat> I know right now that I'm about to read something and some of you guys are going to object to it. Your natural instinct is going to be reject what this, is, what this says. I know it because I've had conversations with people and they don't want to hear this. But Jesus Christ, who is supposed to be your Lord, your Lord and your Savior, the, the, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who spoke the planets into existence, is about to teach you how to deal with evil and persecution and hurt that we are 
in. We are immersed in it right now in our country. And he's about to teach you how to deal with it. And so I pray that you will not be the stubborn one. That you will hear these words and you will give in to them. Amen? Amen. But to you who are willing to listen, I say this. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Our third item was to pray, right? Practice praying. Look, pray for those who hurt you. Now, you got to do yourself a favor. If you want to get anywhere here, you got to put a face to this. You got to put a face to this. Who is it? Who's the one right now? Is it the person who went and killed everyone? Is it a political party affiliation, the other, the other side? Is it the, 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 the leaders of the, the organizations that want to promote uh, abortion, gay marriage, whatever it is? Whatever it is that, that you feel that, 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 that thing that's, that's, that's moving in on your Christianity and you don't know what to do about it, right here around, you've got to put a face on that. And you have to pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek. If someone demands your coat, offer the shirt. Give to anyone who asks. Goes on and goes on. But look at here, verse 31. It says, do to others as you would like them to do to you. You see, so in kind doesn't work anymore, does it? He doesn't want you to act in kind. If they punch you, you don't punch them back. If they steal from you, you don't steal back. What do you do? You show them how you want it. Hey, man, you punched me in the face. That's not the way I wanted you to act toward me. Let me show you the way I wanted you to act toward me. And you do something good. You don't punch them in the face. Anyone stupid enough to punch someone in the face is not going to learn from your punch. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. But they expect you to punch them. And so when you hug them and pray for them and do something good, that's going to knock them for a loop. Look here in verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. So all these things you're supposed to do, you're not supposed to absorb it. You're not supposed to act in kind. You're supposed to pray for them and be kind for, to them. Look what it says here. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. And you must, how much wiggle room is in there? Show me. How much? Zero. He's not offering a suggestion of compassion. He said, you must, if you're mine, you must be compassionate. Just as your father is compassionate. We're supposed to pray for these people. See, listen, when you pray, when you pray, no longer is, is the opportunity to, to respond in kind even on the table anymore. When you pray, the, the, the whole idea of absorbing the sin and the evil and the persecution into yourself is no longer even available to you anymore. Because you just took that, that issue and the pain that's with it and you put it at the altar and you gave it to God who wants it. You don't need to act at all anymore to this. You don't need to freak out anymore because of all the evil around you. You pray for these people. He wants you to give it to him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. God wants you to put your cares on the cross. He wants to take care of this. He said, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't need to do it. So here's the fourth and final thing. We practice perspective. We practice praising. We practice praying. The last thing is we need to practice preparedness. In John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? And when everything is ready, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. So you'll always be where I am. So, so, so there's, a, there's a day that's coming. And, and I don't know when that day is, but it's coming and Jesus even says himself, he doesn't even know what the day is. Only his father knows what the day is. But there's a day that's coming 
when all the wrong will be made right and all your trials and all your suffering will be in the past. It's the day of the Lord's return. It's the second coming of Christ. And I want to show you a little bit about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you turn there with me, I want you to see a little bit about this glorious day that should take the load off of the worry that you might have about what's going on right now. Because there's a day when it's going to get better for sure. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Let's start there. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who have fallen asleep will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And I want to do that because I love you. I love you. And I want you to be encouraged by these words. There's coming a day. We will rip open the sky and Jesus will come and he will save you from all your pain. He will come. And it's not going to be a glorious day for everybody. But I pray that it's a glorious day for you. I pray it is. Look at the next chapter, chapter 5, verse 2. Look at it says, For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. This, this is the part that's scary right here. This is the part that's scary. This, if this isn't the world you live in and the air that we breathe in this country, I don't know what is. Look at it says. He says, it's coming like a thief in the night. And, and when it's coming, like, I don't know the day. I'm not telling you the day, but this is what's going to be happening, right? It says right here that, 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 that when people are saying these following things, that's when he's going to come. They're going to be going, hey, everything's peaceful. Everything's good. I'm good. I'm good, man. Job's rocking. Family's good. I'm healthy. Got cash in the bank. My house is almost paid off. Got equity, man. Everything's good. They're going to be saying everything is peaceful and secure. Then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. Look at And there'll be no escape. Who's had a baby in this room? Raise your hand. Right? So when you had your baby... When the, when the, before the baby actually came, first baby I'm talking about, right? Before you learned. Did you go to the hospital a couple of times? It's the time. No, it's not. They send you home. You're like, Arr! right? You know what I'm talking about, right? But then, right? Then it hits. Wham! Oh, it's time, honey. You know. And you're like, oh, those other times. And your husband's probably going, yeah, whatever. The game's almost over. Let's, you did this four times already, honey, right? <laughs> right? But, but, but all of a sudden, it's like all those other times that you thought it was happening, they were like stubbing your toe compared to when it's happening. Right? And that's exactly what's going to happen. Because once the labor starts, once that baby decides, it's time, I'm coming out, you can't stop it, right? Here it comes. My daughter was so happy the other day. My grandson was born. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Wham, right? But she was there the day before, the two, two, two or three days before, and she's like, it's time, it's time. No, it's not time. Sent her home. She was so ticked. But when it happened, and that's exactly what it says right here. Everything's fine. Uh, you know what? I, I'm good now. Just going to sleep around a little bit. Going to have some drinks. Have a little fun. Do this. And, and someday I'll get right with the Lord. Don't worry about it. That's when he's coming. That's when he's coming. When you think everything's fine, I got this. Wham! That's when he's coming. And I'll just leave you with this. And we're going to sing. We're going to sing one more time, right? Those who rebel, those who are wicked, those who are not righteous, those who have refused the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ, they will receive wrath. 
burning coals and sulfur and scorching winds forever. But those who are righteous, they will be rescued. And they will see his face. They will see his face. Let's pray.